Thank you. I, I don't think I've ever been referred to as the main event before, so uh, it's kind of exciting, a little more pressure. Um, the mic's fine, right? Everything's good to go. Um, so thanks. Uh, my name is Steve Lucas. I'm a lawyer with the law firm of Fask and Martineau. Uh, we uh, you know, love working with you guys, and uh, there's a whole bunch of us out there that do it. Um, I, uh, in addition to being a, a startup lawyer, so to speak, I'm also the chairman of the board of New Ventures BC, so sp I spend a lot of time with the organization and a lot of time uh, uh, really trying to make sure these things work the way they work. So, um, you know, if Angie doesn't behave herself, uh, you can come tell me and, uh, you know, we'll get all of that corrected. But over uh, many, many years, uh, we've never heard that. Um, what, what I've basically done is I've got three parts to my part of the presentation before my partner, David Weatherspoon, who's an intellectual property genius, will uh, come and talk to you about IP strategy. And depending on the timing and the questions and so on, I may uh, I cut out a few of the slides and speed up a few things. So uh, where I will really be starting is, uh, uh, you know, company 101 for dummies. It's uh, uh, the most basic uh, uh, concepts behind what a company is and how it works. And for after that, I have a few slides on financing. You know, when we talk about where do we get money from, and people use phrases like friends and family um, and accredited investors, I'm going to talk a little bit about those sources of financing and so on. And at the end, I'm going to kind of take you through uh, a little bit of, uh, for lack of a better phrase, a uh, flow chart on uh, what your cap structure and your cap table might look like as you go through. Um, if I use vocabulary or concepts or anything here that seem to make sense to me but make no sense to you, the chances are that you're right and I haven't explained it. So please, you know, throw up the hands. There's no question too dumb. I really do mean to have this very, very entry-level discussion, you know, about some of these concepts. So as I think about the speed that I'm talking, if I keep seeing either, you know, heads nodding, yeah, I get it, or people sleeping, I'm going to just assume I'm going at the right speed. Okay, so if you want me to speed up or slow down, you need to let me know. Uh, interactive, please. All questions are welcome. You know, we'll stop, we'll address them. If I'm getting bogged down too much, you know, I reserve the right to tell you I've had enough, I give up, and we'll move on. Um, we will stay at the end and uh, chat, so uh, whatever we can do, uh, um, you know, I will try to do. So, um, kind of the standard marketing blurb from my firm. Uh, we're a big shop, we have offices uh, across Canada and a few others uh, uh, outside of Canada. This again is just kind of a rehash of what we hope to be covering through this. Um, uh, most people find the most fun that very last section, so I'm going to make sure we get to it. Um, if I have to cut stuff out, it will be uh, talking about uh, 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 sourcing the seed capital in particular. So this is, this is the most basic slide, okay? And this is really the level of what we're talking about on these uh, uh, complex corporate structures. So, you know, we, we start with you, and as I get into you, how many people here really, as we are going forward with this business venture that you're on, is this your first real experience with companies, with setting up companies, with running companies, with participating in companies? Okay, good. That makes this worthwhile and a little more fun. How many of you are sitting here going, oh God, not again. I've heard Steve talk about this before and I really don't want to hear this one more time. Perfect. Good audience. Okay. So the, the whole idea, you guys, is that a, a company is a different person, you know, just like you're different from me, okay? A company is just a new person that we create, and they can be set up to have all the same legal rights and restrictions and everything else as you have or I have. And so when you set up a company, it's different than you as a person. And as we're going through my nifty little diagrams here, you're going to see things. Circles represent human beings, okay? Squares, rectangles represent corporate entities. And you'll see triangles and all sorts of other agons, and those represent different types of entities like trusts and partnerships and things like that. So there is some, math, some method to the madness that we use generally when we're talking about these things. So this is you. You got a great idea. We're on our way to commercializing it. And you know as you get out there that there are other people involved. You don't just do this on your own. Okay, whether they're shareholders, directors, officers, whether they're customers, whether they're you know, lecturers, whether they're uh, helpers or pains in the butt, whether they're friends, family, you know, in-laws, whatever it is, there's lots of people out there. I've just kind of thrown four up on the uh, uh, slides. So we want to bring these people together in some form to work together in order to commercialize, okay? And you have lots of choices on how you do it. And you will have heard all of these words up there. There's going to be nothing up there that you haven't heard. And really, you know, the only difference between proprietorships, partnerships, limited partnerships, joint ventures, companies, 
is there a legal organization and their legal meaning, you know? And when I talk about a legal meaning, it's how does it exist as a separate person? What are its rights as a separate person? Proprietorships are just me going out, uh, opening up a, a corner store downstairs, uh, you know, selling newspapers, cigarettes, and so on. I'm not likely to be uh, incorporated. It's just me. You know, I'll call it Steve's Tobacco Shop, and off we go. It's not a company. It's nothing else. It's just, if anything, you know, an alter ego for me. Um, partnerships are a little more formal. You and I will get together. We'll agree to do something together. We're working on it together. But again, no new entity. It's kind of part yours, part mine, and off we go. That's what a partnership is. Limited partnership, a little more formal. Okay, you have people who invest money in it as limited partners and a separate corporate entity called a general partner runs it. None of us are setting our shop up that way, so we're just going to skip right through it. Joint ventures, again, a slightly fancier, more formal form of partnership, and we're going to go straight to companies, and we'll talk about the companies as we move through this. So again, increasingly complex signs. You will see there is a company, and you, the person, are outside the company. Okay? It's separate. There's you, and there's the company. We add in a few more people. Okay? We add in these people as shareholders. They are people who have invested in the company. Okay? They are not part of the company other than being a shareholder. So when a company is out there doing something, entering into a contract, okay, buying something, that's the company that's doing it, not these individuals who have put money in and not you okay, as an individual. But companies inside get a little bit more complicated. So you're going to see in here we have all sorts of different people within the confines of the company. And so you see all these S's for uh, you know, shareholders, D's for directors, O's for officers, E's for employees. You know, these people are all necessary in order to make a company run. And it's a matter really of how do we organize those. And one human being can be okay, a shareholder, a director, an officer, an employee. You don't need to pick one or nothing. You can have be two of these, three of these, four of these, and uh, we'll keep going. So this is ultimately what your company is going to look like. Okay? It doesn't matter how many human beings you have. Every company looks like this. You have the shareholders up top. Okay? They're the ones who own the company, the big box. Inside the company, you have the directors who are superior to the officers, who are superior to the employees. But employees, directors, and officers are all within that corporate box. And then you have the advisory panel, people who you aren't really directors but are providing advice into the box. And some of these are outside consultants like your lawyers and accountants and others, and some we will formalize into an advisory group. Okay? You will see I've got them kind of as a box. Maybe it should be one of my other gones, but uh, uh, you know, they're a separate and outside. And your shareholders can be human beings, or shareholders can hold shares in companies through other associations. So you can incorporate and have a company that holds shares in you, um, however uh, your imagination wants to make that work. I'm incorporated. Okay, this is what my company looks like. All right? This is just to, to run my legal practice. And yes, it's unnecessarily complicated. Okay? <laughs> but you'll see you know, that the individuals up top, which is me, and then you see I have five kids, so you've got K1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And yes, if you want one or two, let me know. I'll simplify my chart. Okay? They all hold their interest in my law business through a family trust. You'll see that the ownership of my, the PLC stands for Personal Law Corporation, SGL, of course, being my initials, okay, are owned by me on commons and a small bit of the prefs, and the other prefs are owned by the trust. But at the end of the day, the, the players here, as you can see uh, uh, listed, is I'm the only director, I'm the only employee, I'm the president, and I'm the only voting shareholder, my wife, because she told me she needed a position in this thing as the secretary, okay? and my kids are non-voting participating shareholders. Okay. This is you know, a, a standard professionally organized company, and we'll come back to uh, you know, kind of all of these roles as we move forward, okay? So speed talk number one, so far so good? All right. Shareholders, what is a shareholder? Okay. So anybody can be a shareholder, okay? No, no prohibitions at all. Individuals, companies, partnerships. You can have as many shareholders as you want. You know, Microsoft has a pile of shareholders. My company has a few, depending on how you want to catch it, count it. Your companies, when and as you set them up, may start with one person and eventually grow. 
you know, to be 5, 10, 20, 50. There, there's no rule. But what you do need to know is that the rules of operating companies change when you hit 50. There is a magic number, you know, a milestone that you hit when you have 50 shareholders. There are also rules on how you can find shareholders. So you can't leave here, okay, after this session, go out on the street, find some guy and offer, you know, one of the street dudes, you know, a couple of shares for 50 cents. Okay? You can't go out there, find a multimillionaire, and sell him 10% of your company for a you know, uh, million dollars. Okay? There are rules, and you need to make sure that you find these shareholders in accordance with the rules, or it's going to come back to bite you. As a shareholder, you have no liabilities for this corporation, okay? other than the money that you have already invested in the company. Okay? Starting with Microsoft, again, as the example, if you buy a thousand shares of Microsoft for hundred thousand dollars, you know, and Microsoft uh, incurs a billion dollars in debt, those creditors can't come back to you and say, hey, you shareholder, okay, I want you to pay off some of Microsoft's debt. We all kind of take that as a given. But for some reason, people seem to think in private companies like what you're going to have, that rule doesn't apply. And that just because I've incorporated doesn't somehow protect me. But it does. Okay? By putting a company in the middle between you and what you're doing, by incorporating, you get rid of all of that liability. Hi, Dave. Glad you could make it. Um, the only exception, really, to this is if you have a contract that says otherwise. So when your company goes to enter into a lease, for example, your landlord is not going to lease the you know, premises to a company with nothing in it. So they're going to say, well, we want you, the shareholder, to personally guarantee the lease and to take on li all the liabilities under that lease. Okay? So your liability isn't because you're a shareholder, it's because you're a guarantor under this other obligation. Okay? You can enter into shareholders agreements with other shareholders that say how we're going to run and how we're going to work and what we're going to do, and you can create obligations that way, but again, it's not because you've invested in the company, it's because you've entered into this other contract. So your rights and your obligations as a shareholder are governed by a number of things the type of share you own. Okay? And again, you can go crazy with your imagination on creating shares, whether they're voting, whether they're participating, meaning do they get a dividend or not? Uh, what do they get if the company goes under? What are the liquidity rights? Okay? Um, you can have, in addition to shares, you can have options, warrants. There are all sorts of things that we talk about in order to create this ownership uh, regiment between individuals who are investing and the company itself. What's special about being a shareholder, okay, you have the exclusive right to elect directors. Okay, that, guys, is fundamentally it. Shareholders don't have any real decision-making opportunities or obligations. All they get to do is decide who the directors are. Okay? You can create a regime, again, by contract, where you have the right to continue to buy shares in your company. So if there are six of us okay, in the company, and we, let's go with five, the mouth's easier, you each have 20% of the company, and somebody goes out to, the company goes out to sell a whole bunch of new stock, and you want to maintain your 20% ownership, you don't have a right to that unless you've created it in these, you know, in either the statutes, okay, the, governing, the governance documents of the company itself, okay, or a shareholders agreement. So your relationships are governed by the articles and by the shareholders agreements. Okay? So the directors are what I call the policy setters. Remember, all the shareholders do is decide who these directors are. And now it's up to the directors to set the policy. Okay. Directors can't elect more directors as a general rule, although they can fill vacancies. So if we have five directors and some guy quits, gets hit by a bus, there's a vacancy, the directors in place can fill that hole. But with the exception of uh, uh, one or two Exceptions, that's the rule. And you must have at least one. There's really no max. Um, in BC, under our rules, there's no residency requirement. So you can have American directors or international directors and whatever uh, uh, ratios you want. There are qualifications to be a director. You have to be over 19. You have to be not certified insane. And other than that, you know, discharge, bankrupt. You know, if you're, if you're in bankruptcy, okay, if you're non compass mentis, or if you're too young, you can't be a director. So directors are given the power to manage the affairs of the company. 
Okay? And it is created both, again, by the corporate legislation and by the same documents I've been talking about already, by shareholders' agreements, by the articles that are in place, and so on. Their job is to determine the policy of the company. Directors, okay, shareholders can do whatever the hell they want with their share. Okay? They can act stupidly. They can act in their own self-interest. They can give it away. They can do whatever they want with it, again, unless you have an agreement that says otherwise. Directors, not so. Directors have legal duties and obligations, okay? and with those duties and obligations comes potential liabilities. So directors' duties are to the company and the shareholders as a whole. A director can't act in his own best interests or in the interests of his investment in the company at the expense of others. Okay? And if you do so, you can take on personal liability. You can breach those duties, and you can also get personal liability as a director for things like taxes, and wages. If you've got employees and you've been withholding or you should have been withholding from their uh, paychecks um, and you've got your CPP and you've got your EI, these monies are to go to the government and if you, the company doesn't send it to the government, the directors are going to get to pay that for them. Okay? So the directors also get to appoint the officers. Okay? So the directors set the policy, the directors have these overriding duties, but at the end of the day, they delegate down most of the operations to what I call the instructors or the officers. So again, they're appointed by the directors. So your shareholders don't decide who the president is. Your directors decide, sorry, your shareholders decide who the directors are and the directors will decide who the president is. Okay, there's a very clear, distinct set of steps here. You can have as many officers as you want and you can call them whatever you want. So you can have president, you can have chairman of the board, you can have CEO, COO, CTO, you know, whatever you want. I, I, nobody really cares. Chief bottle washer, okay, however you want to organize your company. You can delegate specifically to these officers jobs they're to do, or their jobs can kind of be created through the system as you uh, work with them and as people take on their responsibilities. And it's the officers who are in charge of the day-to-day -day function of the company, right? It isn't in an in, in a company that has a number of employees, it is not the director's job to hire and fire the receptionist. It's the officer's job. It's not the director's job to decide what your letterhead's going to look like or how many pounds of paper you should be buying at a time. Okay? That's not their role. Beneath the officers are the doers, the employees, the people who really get it done. There is a massive distinction between an employee and a contractor okay? that is well uh, a kind of outside the scope of what I can talk about today. But you do need to know that there is a difference. You do need to know that whether someone is an employee or a contractor, it's not by what you call them. It's not by the form of agreement you enter into. It's by the role that they play and by the jobs that they do within the company. And if you call somebody the wrong thing, you can be creating problems you know, uh, with the, our friends, the tax people, and the individual themselves who are working for you. Okay, and so if you're having any questions, if you don't understand, it's a good place to do that little bit of quick legal advice. You should always have an employment agreement in place with your employees, and you should have a, a contractor's agreement in place with your contractors. What you really want to make sure you have in here is to create this duty of confidentiality so they don't go blabbing. And as David will talk about, I'm sure, in his uh, uh, spiel, you want to make sure that any intellectual property that may be created by these employees is irrevocably assigned to the company. So when an employee goes away, either because you fired them or because they've left, you don't need to worry about them having a key piece of your intellectual property. Okay? It can get very expensive at the time of exit to go to a former employee who didn't like you in the first place and say, you know, you're holding up our billion dollar sale. I need you to sign this piece of paper. Would you please do that for me? Uh, it gets expensive. Um, compensation of employees. You can pay an employee, again, however you want. You can pay them in cash, shares, options, cars, okay? uh, you know, boats, whatever you want to do. No big deal. But all of these things have value, and the value of the consideration that these people receive is to be taxed. Okay? Just because you give somebody stock that has no value because they can't resell it, if I give you for doing my code 100,000 shares of a company that's worth a buck a share, you've earned $100,000 in income, okay? and you pay tax on that $100,000 in income. I've given you no cash to pay it, so you're going to have to find the cash somewhere else from some other source, but hey, you've got a bunch of my stock. 
We talk about advisors, okay? These are people who are not any of the things I've already talked about. They're people who are outside the corporate box. Try to restrict your advisors to, uh, as I say, non-director experts, okay? If people are a director, make them a director. But you know, if somebody, all what they're contributing to your business, it's easiest to use life sciences as an example. You know, if there is a physician who is an expert in the area that you're conducting your research into, you don't want him as a director because he knows nothing about running a company or financing or this or that or the other thing, marketing. He's a physician and you want him to help you with the science. So make him an advisor, okay? It's a single purpose expert that you're bringing in and their role is to advise the board, okay? Sometimes advise the C-level people, but it's not to make decisions on behalf of the company. It's to take the expertise that they have Okay, and provide that advice to the company. So we come back around to you know, my initial little structure picture, and I hope you know, this now makes just a little bit more sense. But if you are there now and you incorporate tomorrow and you're all by yourself, you're gonna be the only shareholder, the only director, officer, and employee. And when you do something, you should remember which hat it is you're wearing. You know, like right, right now as I'm making this decision or I'm incurring this obligation, Okay, am I doing this in my capacity as an A, B, C, or D? Okay, know what you're doing because it impacts those liabilities and those relationships, and in particular as you grow. Lots of other issues to think about just in the basic setup of your company as you go through. You know, there's lots of conflicts of interest, right? There's a conflict of interest between your personal, not just emotions, but your obligations when it comes to acting as a, share, as a, uh, a shareholder or a director. This is just an internal conflict that's always going to be there for you folks as you uh, do your startups. What if you're a director of multiple companies? Okay? How, how do you deal with allocating your time, allocating your ideas, your resources between company one, two, and three? So for those of you who are getting involved in companies and you're bringing in outside help in order to work with you, and these other people that we're so excited we've got joining our board, okay, providing advice, if they're involved in other companies, which they likely are, how are we going to deal with that? If you're coming out as a spin-off from an institution, you know, whether it's UBC, SFU, or any of the other uh, great institutions, there are conflicts of interest there as well. Okay? The duty as a professor to your university versus your desire to commercialize what you're doing. And all of these conflicts get you know, dealt with, but they are things you need to identify and you need to work with. So setting up that initial structure, where do we do it? Do we do it in Canada? Do we do it in the US? If we, sorry, I was just getting my watch off. That didn't work subtly at all. It wasn't my fault. Um, in, in Canada, Canada versus international, you know, you're going to hear from us unless your crystal ball is really, really, really good. Okay, as to where you're going and how you're doing it, stay within Canada. It's far cheaper, it's far easier to explain, it's far easier to understand. There's lots of grants available in Canada that aren't available for non-Canadian companies. Um, there's taxation and employment issues. You wanna keep your costs down starting out, you're gonna be far better off. If you happen to know that what you're working on is gonna be country specific for some reason, that you just know it's gonna end up in the valley or you know that your purchaser is gonna come out of the US, then there's a good reason perhaps to think about setting up south of the border, okay? But again, your crystal ball has to be a lot better than mine. Yep. Oh, Mike. So if, if you incorporate in Canada and for some reason the business evolves in another fashion, can you actually move your incorporation somewhere else later on or is it one time? You, you can. Uh, you know, the magic word is called continuation and yes, you can move your company, so to speak, elsewhere. Um, while it's very simple, it can also be expensive because what the, our government taxation guys feel is when you move your company out of Canada, there's a deemed sale of every asset within the company at its fair market value and you get to pay tax on that growth. And if you've got IP in your company that you've rolled in at zero, you know, and now it's worth a couple of million bucks because our company's starting to succeed, you get to pay tax on the value of that growth. So. Um, it's not something that really happens all that often unless there's, again, a really, really good reason for it. Um, you can choose between incorporating in any given province or incorporating federally. And again, you know, the BC Act is uh, uh, just a little bit easier to work with than federally, so you find most companies here in BC are being set up as a, a BC company. Um, 
I, again, just coming through this. Make your company simple, folks. Okay? Don't get complicated. We don't need a massive number of shares. Okay? They don't need to have fancy bells and whistles attached to them. So just create you know, a, a share structure with an unlimited number of common shares so you can sell them without having to worry about coming back and changing things. I talk about blank check prefs here. It's just a second class of shares. By blank check, all what it means is the directors can decide what they look like. They don't need to come back to the shareholders with them. Um, you're going to find that the people are going to invest in your company. The financiers are going to dictate the terms. The phrase that's used is it's the golden rule. You know, he with the gold makes the rules. And uh, you're going to find never is that being more true than in the case of startup companies. Right? And so people who are investing are going to tell you what your shares are going to look like. They're going to tell you the terms of the shareholders agreement. They're going to go through all these things. So trying to guess now and set all of that up uh, isn't going to help anywhere. Again, kind of my rules of thumb are if you can, you know, avoid issuing debt generally, avoid using shareholders' loans. Um, the reason behind this is when you go out to raise equity, your investors don't want to see the money being used to pay back debt. They want to see that money being put into the company and advancing the technology. And if you have all of these uh, financial burdens already there, it becomes more and more complicated. Uh, quickly on founder shares. So people talk always about founder shares and when you set up your company you're going to issue yourself founder shares, which are shares that are, you pay virtually nothing for. Okay? In North America you can't issue shares for nothing. You actually have to pay for them. All right? But there's nothing wrong with paying one one millionth of a penny per share. Okay? But if you get a million shares at one, mil one millionth of a penny per share, you take your penny and you put it in the bank. Okay? You make the deposit. Okay? And it's just required. All right? So you get really, really, really cheap stock. Those are founder shares. And these refer to large blocks of stock that are issued really, really cheap to the founders. And it's there to recognize the sweat equity you're going to put into this company for the next you know, n number of years. Okay? They should be common shares, very simple, and as I said, at a very nominal value. They should only be issued to the founders okay, and to brand new senior officers. And when I talk about brand new, I mean coming in at the very beginning of the company. They are not there to incent uh, employees okay, or outside investors. Sorry, Ash. Uh, in terms of, so I understand that the issuing um, value is very low, but from a filing position as a founder, do you have to have a filing position for your personal taxes? Similar to if you had invested in a company at a very, very low price, you do still need to file in terms of, uh, like, what would the filing position be? So uh, to, to me, when I hear the phrase filing position, uh, you know, I'm hearing we're doing something aggressive from a tax point of view and we need to be able to justify the tax base. The whole thing about being able to issue these shares at a fraction of a penny is it's right when you set up the company. There is nothing in the company. Okay? It has no business. It has no idea. It has nothing. It's just some stupid little company that's out there without even a name, quite possibly. So it's worth exactly that, nothing. Okay? After you buy those shares and this company turns around and buys IP from you or rolls your intellectual property into the company, you know, it pays value for that and the company starts generating value. So, you know, there is no need for a filing position in that sense because it is what it is. Okay. Question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's imagine you have a company uh, and you've got one million shares for a for hundred of dollars initially and then you've got a round of investment for a hundred thousands of dollars, that is 10% of uh, your shares. Uh, that gives us the valuation of one million. And um, you have all these shares, 90% of shares, and you have now the company that costs one million dollars. And is it taxable and should you pay taxes now for this um, 900,000? So there is, a, again, a million and one buried questions in there, so I'm going to pick the one I want to answer, and I'll, I'll answer that one, okay? So until you sell your shares, okay, you do not have a taxable event, okay? So if you, and it's just, again, let's go to Microsoft. If you bought it today for $100 on the market, and it went up to 120 and then up to 130, you, you don't have to pay tax on it as that value increases. When you sell it at 130, you have to pay the tax, 
Okay? If you had to sell it every time there's a price change, your tax returns would be brutal because every day in the market your price would change and you'd have gains and you'd have losses and you know, it would be unimaginable. Same in a private company. Until you sell those shares, there is no gain. Okay? The fact that the value is going up, congratulations, but no, there's no taxable event in there. Okay? Yeah. What's a good source of precedent documents that might give you something similar to like a Delaware company and all the standard things that investors are typically looking for, but that's appropriate to BC? Um, you know, if you uh, go into a lot of law firms' websites, you're going to find precedent documents for a lot of this stuff. If you go to, you know, the BC government, uh, you can incorporate your own company without the help from anybody, and some of those basic documents are there. You know, one of the, one of the things that I tell clients, if you're walking into my office and we were having this chat, is, you know, it's easy enough to do, but creating the relationship amongst shareholders and so on is a lot like asking me to write a prenuptial agreement for you and your spouse. Okay, and sure, you can grab somebody's prenup off the internet, you know, and good luck living by their rules. Okay, you know, or you can spend a few minutes with me and we can custom design your relationship the way you guys want your relationship to be, and off you go. So, you know, if you use precedence for this stuff, really, the, the starting, it, it's a starting point. Don't just blindly enter into them. Um, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of speaking on, uh, you know, angel investing and so on uh, with angels and VCs and so on. And, one of the things that they talk about is that it's way, way, way more difficult and expensive to get us lawyers to fix things after they've been done wrong. And it's not that your company isn't incorporated, but if you have a share structure that doesn't suit where you want to go and the way you want to go, uh, it's going to take you way longer and cost you way, mo way more money. So, you know, use it to educate yourself, but I would be very reluctant to suggest you sign them regardless. Yeah. So speaking of uh, mistakes then, um what if you haven't assigned 4 million shares? Is that a fixable thing? If you have... Everything's assigned, fixable, yeah. okay? You know, it just depends to how and how long it will take. You know, it depends what your company looks like. If you have four shares now and you have no other shareholders, you know, then we can either issue you a whole bunch more or what, if the price has gone up in the meantime, what you do is you can subdivide your stock and say, well, each old share is now worth a million new shares. And so, yeah, we, we can deal with all of that. Okay, I've got to move on, so hold the questions, but let me keep going. Um, so again, common mistakes, not giving yourself enough founder shares, right? As I said, we can subdivide them, but if you get a little ways down the road and go, shit, I wish I had more, uh, I can't really do that. Um, save some founder shares, perhaps, or build into your calculation that there might be people uh, uh, coming in uh, uh, imminently that may need some. And vest the founder shares, okay? Vesting means there, there are three of us going into business together. We each say, yeah, we're going to put five years of our life into it. And we're all really important into this business. Okay? And we're each getting two million shares for that. And on my way out of here, I'm going to go down to the Cactus Club. I'm going to grab a couple of beers. I'm going to fall in love with one of the waitresses there. And we're going to disappear to Rio for the rest of our lives. Um, I've got my two million shares. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Okay. We get six months down the road, okay? I come back from Rio, and now one of you guys decides I hate the fact that you were down there, and you know what? I'm just screwing off, and I'm going to set up my own shop, and I'm going to do something different, okay? You've got your shares, and there's nothing I can do about it, okay? My former best friend, okay, and partner is now a competitor and an enemy, and I can't get those shares back. So the reality is that we're all sitting there going, yeah, we're going to commit five years of our lives to this business venture, okay? So what we're going to say is, uh, you know, if I leave in one year, I'll give you back four-fifths of what I got. If I leave in two years, I'll give you back three-fifths of what I got. Okay? Those are, you know, the vesting periods. We can do it monthly. We can do it weekly. We can do it hourly if you're really nuts, okay? Um, we can vest based on achievements and milestones, you know. Uh, we can have one-third of it vest. If my job is to raise money, we can have one-third of it vest when I raise the first hundred grand, and another third when I raise the next million, and another third when I finally sell this company. Okay? You can do whatever you want with it, but the point is you're getting these shares up front okay, on the theory that as a group you're going to devote a significant amount of time, energy, in order to make this work. Um, prepare a financing plan right off the start. Okay? You know when you go home today and go, geez, I've got to call Steve tomorrow to incorporate my company. 
okay, you know eventually you're going to need some more shares. You're going to need to raise some more money because you know, the 50 bucks we put into it so far just isn't going to get us to a billion dollar company. We know that. And what you got to do right away, even before you incorporate, I'd suggest, is to figure out how much money are we going to need when? For what my business is and what my plan is between today and when I'm going to be able to sell this thing, okay? What are the milestones? I'm going to need this much to get here, then I'm going to need this much to get here, then I'm going to need this much to get here. How many times do I need to go to market? What is it that I'm going to achieve in order to cause an increase in the price? As a result of that increase in price, how many shares are we going to be? And you set this out generally as a roadmap, and you know, you're going to be way the hell off, okay? I guarantee that, okay? But the fact is that you've done it, and the fact is that it's allowing you to come back now to decide how many shares should I get off the get-go. Um, just because I do need to leave David some time to uh, talk, I'm going to uh, uh, even speed up more through some of these things. There are lots of sources of financing for a company, okay? There are lots of government grants. There are uh, organizations like BCIC, uh, uh, that's our sponsor, um, a variety of banks, private and public. You can get money from all sorts of individual sources. We give them all labels. Okay, that initial financing, the initial equity financing can come from you. There are a lot of people who will sit there. If you came to me and said, you know, can you invest 50,000 in my company? And I go, this sounds really exciting. How much money have you invested in the company? And you say nothing. I'd go, well, if you're not willing to invest your own money, why should I invest my money? Okay, and you know, there's lots of answers to that question. You know, if you say, well, I'll put in 10 grand, but that's all I got because I can't, you know, my house is mortgaged, I really don't have anything, all good answers, okay? But if you've got a house that's nicely paid for and a car that's nicely paid for and you're not willing to go out and expose your own assets to your business venture, good luck getting people to go. So, you know, the founders are the, uh, really the starting point. Then your friends and family, you know, you've got to be able to talk your mother and or Aunt Sue or Uncle, you know, Bob into investing in your company. If you can't get them to invest, okay, again, it's going to be really hard to get an outsider to invest. Are you go taking a couple oh, questions? Oh, sure. Okay. How do you value your time, energy, and effort into your business plan? Like maybe you spent a year doing a business plan before you do your startup, and someone's asking you like how much money you put in. How do you put a, a value on? There, there's, there's no rule that's you know, possible to answer that question, right? You know, yes, you should always have a business plan. Without your business plan, okay, how are you going to establish these milestones? How are you going to know what you're doing? How are you even going to get a basic idea of what this venture is going to cost? All right, so yeah, you, you need the business plan. As to you know, how do you value things, every company is different, every individual is different, and it's all you know, based on you guys and that plan and that model. If you're sitting there going, I'm going to be the CEO of the startup, you know, and I'm going to pay myself $250,000 a year as the CEO and my brother $200,000 as the uh, CTO, um, you're not going to get funded. Okay? So between that and nothing, there's an answer. What I, what I meant was, let's say you've already spent your time and effort, mm -hmm. and you might have money from one source or two, and they ask, well, how much money did you put in yourself besides your own money? Like, can you put a value financially on time, effort, education, knowledge, all these other things you did before? I, 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 I'm, I'm going to say, you know, it, there, there's a yes and a no component to that, right? The no is that it won't show up on your financial statements. It won't show up on the balance sheet. It's not there anywhere. Okay, it's all buried in these founder shares that we're talking about. So you've already got paid for that through the founder, through those shares. So nobody really cares about that from a dollar point of view. Sure, we care that you are nice enough and you, you know, put in your time and effort in order to create what you've got. Okay, but it's not the same as taking dollars and putting it in. Okay. Sorry, there's uh, one back here first and then Take the lady on the left, and then we'll move on. So the BC regime around qualified investors is pretty simple. Um, in the US, the SEC is putting some rule changes in with regards to general solicitation. How does that potentially impact a BC company that's looking to raise funds cross-border? So way, way beyond, okay, what I'm going to spend any time talking on, 
All right, you know, I mean, the whole cross-border thing throws wrinkles in all over the place. You know, if you're talking about the crowdfunding changes and so on coming through, um, that too is uh, in and of a speech itself. And other than saying that the rules are changing for crowdfunding, I, I just uh, am not in a position to address that now. But I'm happy to chat with you afterwards. But, ma'am? Yeah? If you're looking for ways to compensate strategic partners instead of getting funding, is, um, and I understand that shares are, are not, um, issuing shares are not attractive to venture capitalists in the future. Is there any difference between share issues or stock options from a legal perspective, venture capital perspective, or taxation perspective? Uh, the, the answer is yes, for sure. And again, I can't go through each one of those because it would take up easily the rest of the night. Right? But the taxation you know, of options, and you know, this, uh, we, uh, uh, the, the Angel Forum was today as well, and we just did a three-hour session yesterday on taxation of stock options, you know, just on that one issue. So yes, there are big differences, and uh, you know, it's consideration like anything else, and you need to work out that relationship with your partners. But they're all good you know, sources of funding if you can get partners to start playing along for some of that. Okay, and you'll see my last bullet here talks about strategic partners, so well done. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm just going to uh, skip through this. this. This chart just shows kind of some of these areas and the amounts of money here in you know, BC that we generally tend to see people raising from each of these. There, there are requirements, as I said, in BC that says you can't just go out and get money from anybody. In fact, the rule says you need to have a prospectus unless there's an exception to the rule. And a prospectus is a multi-hundred thousand dollar document that takes months and months to do. And uh, as a result, everything we do in the startup phase and in these private equity financings that we're doing are all done pursuant to exemptions from the prospectus requirements. Um, you, you hear about, again, family, friends, business associates, accredited investors, uh, private issuers offering memorandum as the main ones. And what you can do is you can sell securities in any amount without any disclosure to these people, in particular family members, the directors, senior officers, or control people. So you don't have the ability to sell it to a close friend of a close friend. Okay? You need that direct link to somebody who's inside the company. Um, it doesn't matter how many of these people you have. Okay? You can go on and on and on and keep raising money. As I said, there's no limits, but you need that nexus to an insider of the company. So what is a close personal friend or a close business associate? Um, the test is really soft. Okay? You have to have known the insider of the company for a sufficient period of time. All right? And you need to be in a position to assess the capabilities and trustworthiness of that insider. In other words, what it's all about is if you have a relationship with somebody that's sufficient that they're not going to lie to you, okay? or you're going to be able to tell if they are, then you can invest. And what is a close personal friend or a close business associate for some people isn't for others. All right? I mean, what to me might be a close personal friend, for you may be a complete stranger. Okay, it's, and, and that's why this isn't defined anymore, all right? It varies from one to one to one. You have two neighbors. On one side, you know, it's uh, high hairy when you're cutting the grass, and that's the extent of it. On the other side, you know, you uh, have dinner together, you know, every uh, second week, and your kids have dated for years, and, you know, life's gone on. Clearly, there's a different relationship, and one may be a close personal friend, the other one likely isn't. You know, and again, no rules of thumb, but I joke with people, if you know the brand of toothpaste he uses, you're probably okay, all right? If you know how many bathrooms they have in their house, you may be pushing it. You know, anything less uh, is a tough one. Accredited investors are basically saying, look, if people, certain designated people have a sufficient net worth and a sufficient knowledge that they're smart enough that they can make their own investment decisions without help, all right? And that they're wise enough to ask the right questions. Um, there are thresholds in there that set out the basics for these descriptions. And when you're looking at these thresholds of a net worth of a million dollars, that does not include residential real estate. Okay? So just because your house in Vancouver is worth more than a million bucks doesn't make you an accredited investor. Okay? You can sell your house, take the money you're now an accredited investor and rent, but that's the way the system is set up. Okay? Sorry, running out, we're going to go through a few of these. So if, if you're marketing something under an offering memorandum, you know, people have the right to get their money back. Okay? That's the consequence of the breach for the most part. And these rights go on forever. Okay? It's a perpetual right of rescission. They can come back at you in 15 years. 
and go, oh, remember I bought these shares from you for five bucks, they're now worth $1.30, I want my money back. Okay? And that's the way it works. There are exemptions out there for employees, so you can issue shares to employees, and there are exemptions out there for the issuance of shares to certain consultants. So this is where I wanted to speed talk to and spend uh, uh, just the last few minutes before I hand it over to David. And that's to go through kind of a, a simple but relatively typical cap table or capitalization table. And when you're going out to raise your money, everybody wants to see this, okay? When you're analyzing your company, everybody wants to know this information. And so this is just showing on a, a little bit of an entry by entry basis what your company is going to change and how it's going to morph as we add shareholders and as we issue shares. So we start today with my uh, hypothetical three founders. <coughs> We have a total of six million shares. We've issued these shares for a fraction of a penny a share, and we've raised a grand total of $600. Okay? Very typical. The value of your company today is $600. The founder's interest in the company today, they own 100%, but it's worth all of $600. Okay? Easy starting point. So let's go out now and find our friends and family, and let's raise a little bit of real money here. So we raise... We issue 400,000 shares to friends and family at a quarter a share, and we raise our first 100 grand. Okay? And we did that because usually it's, well, we needed 100 grand. Uh, we talked Aunt Molly into the fact that a quarter was fair. She was able to do it. We found some others. We conned them into it too, and so now we got our 400,000 shares at a quarter a share. So again, using some of the lingo, our pre-money valuation was a million five, and what that was is the six million shares you had out there times a quarter a share, because that's what we agreed it was worth. So by definition, our company was worth a million five. The post money value is the million five we had plus the money we raised. Okay, so our post money valuation is now a million six. Okay, the founder's interest, and we do it on a pre-money basis, is now a million five. Okay, but we only have 93.75% of this company. Okay, we've issued shares, we own less of the company, but suddenly, we've got this massive value. Okay? We had six million shares. It's worth a quarter now. We're now worth a million and a half bucks. We then, I want to talk about stock options just real quickly. We're going to create a stock option pool in my company. Okay? This gives people the right to purchase shares in the future. Okay? And I'm going to stop on options there. A few little concepts on what should be there. The price should be fair market value. Again, we can talk about that later if you want. The stock options show up in my cap table underneath this total, okay? Because they're not issued. We don't know <coughs> if they're going to be. We don't know if they ever will be. So it's there. There is no price because we don't know if they'll be exercised or whatnot, and there have been no funds raised. These things will pop up in the future. The creation of an option plan doesn't create an exercise price. It's when you grant those options to your employees that you will attach an exercise price to it. So for the cap table, all we can do is throw in that number as being the maximum number. And you'll see there's no change at all to our pre-money value or post-money value or our uh, equity interests. We're doing really well in this company, so we're going out and we're going to raise uh, you know, another 400 grand from angels. And we found a bunch who are willing to pay 35 cents a share for this. And we're going to sell them 1,200,000 shares. So again, as we go down through, the pre-money value was 2,240 now because that was the former issued and outstanding shares times the 35 cents. And we get to 2,240. We add the 420 that we're raising now and we get a post money of 2,660. Again, our value now, the founder's interest is down to 79%, right? We're rapidly losing control of this company, so to speak. We've gone from 100% down to 79 but for those of you who are sitting here going, there's no way in hell I'm giving up 20% of my company. Remember when we started, we had 100% of this thing worth $600. We now have 80% and it's worth $2 million one. Okay? So it's how big the pie is far more important than you know, how many pieces of pie there are going to be. We then go on. We get our VCs involved. They come in and we continue to do well. We're up to 50 cents. We raise another million five to take us to the next milestone. Issue them 3 million shares. Okay, again, the numbers come down. So the post money value is now 5 million three. You know, this is getting to be a decent little company, right? Um, and the founders' interests are now down to about 57%, right? But it's up to $3 million. So the company that you've started out, your interest in it is now worth 3 million. The company's worth 5 million three. 
We then go out and now we're really, you know, kind of starting to hit it out of the ballpark. We've got uh, a, a VC interested uh, big time or we're going to do an IPO, uh, do our initial public offering. Um, we got a dollar per share. We're raising three million bucks in order to finally hit this thing all the way home. You'll see at this stage, we've now got a total of 13,600,000 shares issued. It's a buck a share, right? The pre-money here before we went out was 10 million six. It's now 13 million six. We're down to 44% as founders, okay? But it's worth six million dollars. And when I told you at the beginning to do your, your financing plan, this is the idea behind what you should be doing. You know, are these numbers, the funds raised, the right numbers for those milestones at that point? If we achieve the milestones, is it going to justify the pricing that I've talked about in order to get there? And if we're sitting there going, my ego dictates that at the end of the day when this goes public, I need 50% of this company or I'm not interested, we didn't issue ourselves enough founder shares at the start. So we redo the math, okay, today we get ourselves 8 million shares instead, we play around with all these numbers, we see if we can make it work. Okay, and so that's kind of back to here's the finish, but it really ties completely into the beginning. And now our options get exercised. In my example, we issued these options, okay, at 35 cents. So back when we did the angel round, that's when we granted these options to people. So they now exercise their options. Two million new shares are issued. It comes up above the table, right? It used to be here, sorry, above the total because it's now issued. They've gone from being just a, a drag into being real, okay? At 35 cents, it's generated another $700,000. And you'll see that what's gone on here now is the percentage interest has dropped from 47 to 42, okay? We got even, even fewer shares. So that's where I wanted to get to from the absolute start. And uh, I've got probably, David, will you give me five minutes for questions? There you are. And then uh, we'll go. Well, you don't want that. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll do five minutes now. David will speak. And then uh, uh, when he's done, uh, I'm happy to come back, answer a few more. And as I said, we can uh, uh, talk after as well. So you have a Hands up if you have a question. I'm just wondering, with regards to um, friends and family round, yeah. um, if you do a convertible debenture, convertible note, is that in any way viewed as a negative to the angel round? Will they look at that and, and see that as uh, not a good way to do things? It, it's not that they're going to see it as not a good way to do things. They're going to sit there and go, so what are you going to do with this convertible debenture? Right? Because as an angel, I'm not going to put my money into the company with this debt instrument hanging over my head. Doesn't it convert at, okay. the, at the... It depends on the terms. I mean, if you're telling me that your convertible debenture converts at the time of the financing, um, then it just becomes equity up above the line and your angels aren't going to care. It'd be a non-issue. Okay, however many shares you have out there at the time that they come in is all your, you know, dilution and not the angels. So as long as it's cleaned up at that time, they couldn't care less. Uh, who is in charge of signing dividends in the company? Shareholders or directors? I'm sorry, in charge of? Dividends. Um, it is the directors who decide whether there are dividends. And can, uh, can a director assign dividends to certain shareholders or to all of them? If you have one class of shares, you have to pay the same dividend on each share within that class. If you have multiple classes of shares, so some commons, some prefs, or three classes of commons, or eight classes of prefs, however many you want to do, you can pay dividends on a class-by-class -class basis, and that will depend on the terms of those shares. So some shares will say, well, you have to pay me a dividend before you can pay them a dividend. But can you pay dividends to like uh, certain people, not to everybody, not to all shareholders, but just to... Wh to within, within a class. Right? So yes. all commons need to receive the same dividend. Okay? You can okay. waive the dividend. So if it's like me and my wife and I want her to have the, sh have the money and not me, you know, oh, okay. I'll say every share you know, gets a 10 cent dividend and I'm going to go, well, I don't want mine. Okay? You can do that, but you need to have their cooperation. Okay. Thank you. Hi, 
I just I had a question about options and like what rights do option holders have with respect to, I guess, uh, let's say stock splits and let's say uh, the responsibilities of directors. So uh, again, options are fun because they're governed by you know, a, a plan generally. And that plan is a contract between the company and the people who are going to get the options. And so it can say whatever the heck you want it to say. So you have to read your plan or draft your plan very, very carefully. Because what it can say in it really is, well, you have no rights at all and I reserve the right to change my mind and not give you options. It can say I reserve the right to change the exercise price from a nickel to $2,000. You know, they don't, okay? I'm being flippant as I say this. But each plan is different and it's being created for a different purpose. Now, generally, an option has no rights at all as a shareholder, okay? Because you, are, you don't own a share yet. So you have no voting rights, you have no participation rights, you don't have the right to attend meetings, you don't have the right to receive financial statements until you exercise your option and acquire a share. If there are dividends paid while you're an option holder, most plans will say, too bad, so sad, you should have exercised. Okay? Um, as far as splits go, they will usually reflect the split. So if you had the option to buy 100,000 shares at a dime and it splits 10 to 1, you now have an option to buy a million shares at a penny. Okay, so it will usually follow, but not always. Okay, okay so it's been five minutes. It has. Um, David, yeah, so we'll, we'll take a five-minute break to switch over. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, first things first, let me demonstrate for you that I'm a lawyer. There's my disclaimer. It means you can't rely on anything I say. Um, but what else would you expect? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about... Um, intellectual property, but I'm going to try to focus on strategy around intellectual property. But first I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, Steve is a business lawyer. He's my, actually my favorite business lawyer because he's a very practical guy. Um, I'm, a, I'm not a business lawyer. I'm a litigator. So I sue bad people. A lot of what I do relates to suing people around intellectual property issues. So just as one example, um, a case I did for the Law Society of British Columbia uh, a few years ago. They have a website, lawsociety.bc.ca, and they have another one, lsbc.org. Um, <clears throat> there was uh, an enterprising young fellow. I haven't looked at every face in the room. A very entrepreneurial young man. Maybe he's one of you. Uh, he thought he could make some money off of uh, .ca domain names, and he registered a whole bunch of names. Uh, some of them were available for lease, some for sale. Um, he had names like uh, negligentlawyer.ca, thinking that someone might want to buy that. Um, anyway, but he also had a number of, of names that uh, he relied on for click-through fees. And he linked the... So he had the domain name lawsocietyofbc.ca and... If you, if you went to that website, it would take you through to this page, a porn site. And he got his you know, fraction of a penny for every time somebody went there. And as you might expect, the Law Society got a few complaints about this and so asked me to assist. Um, so I sent him the typical demand letter that you know, you're breaching the Law Society's rights in its name and so on. And he wrote back and said, well, you know, I don't really think there's any confusion which is normally a hallmark of trademark uh, uh, rights, is that there's some kind of confusion. And his point was, so far as I know, the Law Society doesn't engage in pornography, so what's wrong with uh, Anyway, so I just didn't respond to that. I just sued him. And his response was then to not redirect his website to a porn site, but to re redirect it to the uh, marijuana party of BC, which I thought was quite funny. Um, Anyway, uh, we were successful, as you might expect, in convincing a judge that that wasn't uh, cricket. So that's the sort of thing I do. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the value of IP, obviously, from this slide. And this is just one example of how you can find value from intellectual property. So in 1990, IBM made about $30 million from licensing out its patents. At that point in time, it was the number one patent filer in the world. Uh, someone had the good idea, why don't we license our stuff out more? And in the ensuing 10 years, their revenue went from 30 million to about a billion dollars. 
And that's really free money. And I say it's free money because they were doing all the research and development anyway. And this is then licensing people, allowing other people to benefit from the work they're doing. So it's just I, I include that slide as a way to demonstrate that there can be tremendous value from intellectual property. Skip that one, sorry. So here's a few, here's the quiz part of the presentation. Uh, and identify the intellectual property. And I'm looking for audience participation here, please. So anybody, yeah, here's a, sorry. We have to have microphones. Maybe this audience participation. The brand. Sorry? The brand. Okay, and how do you protect a brand? Copyright, I believe. Trademark. Trademarks, yes. So trademark is the answer. Uh, there's actually uh, a couple of other um, items in here as well. So you've got the name Chloe, which is protected as a trademark, and that's the brand. You've got a pattern on the box, although it's a, a bit obscure under the lights here. Uh, so that would be protected as a copyright. And then you've got the unique shape of the bottle, which in Canada is called an industrial design. In other, most other countries, it's called a design patent. Um, and then if that shape of the bottle becomes known uh, as the source of the particular product, it can uh, be protected as a distinguishing guise. Here, so we don't have to run around with a mic so much. I'll just tell you the answers. How's that? Um, so there's two key things in this uh, Google logo. One is that, of course, the name, Google. It's one of the 10 most valuable uh, brands in the world now. I forget how many billions of dollars it is worth. Uh, and then you would also have copyright in the, you know, the look of the logo. This is a Sierra Wireless Air Card, bit dated technology now. Uh, so there's several things here. Um, you know, the, the wave would be protected as a copyright, the names as, as trademarks. But one thing that I think is, was really innovative is the red tip is protected as a trademark, right? And so they, they wanted to, their cards to be uh, identified, even though they were buried inside the uh, laptop. And so they were the first one to conceive the idea of using a red tip, and they protected it. You can have protection in color, uh, and even now in Canada, you can have protections in a sound mark. Uh, the Gillette sensor, there's something like 22 different patents in that product. Matt's Clamato juice, I put this in because one of the leading cases on protecting trade secrets is fighting about the rights in this Matt's Clamato. And so the Clamato juice is protected as a secret. The formula is very closely guarded, like Coca-Cola, KFC, those sorts of things. Um, so if you write a poem, when I put these quizzes in here, I wasn't thinking about having to run around with a microphone. So I'm going to ask the question, and then I'll answer them. And I happen to know the answers. Um, <laughs> if you write a poem, and you leave it to someone in your will, can they sell copies of the poem? How will we do it this way? If you think they can sell copies of the poem, hold up your hand. Mm, roughly half. Um, you're wrong. Sorry, don't mean to hurt your ego. But, um, and I use this example to illustrate the difference between owning property in a property, physical thing, and owning the, the intangible or intellectual property right. Um, if you are left a copy of the poem, you own only that copy of the poem. You are not being left the right to make copies of the poem. And it's the making copies that is the, the, the intellectual property, right? In this particular case, um, copyright. How do you protect ideas? Uh, well, you can, there's two key ways. One we just covered, uh, or, or uh, uh, you know, the idea of the, the Mats Clamato juice, you keep it a secret. There are certainly a number of things, though, that uh, where you could choose to patent it or choose to keep it secret. And you have to make a strategic decision along the way. So the, the folks at Coca-Cola back in, whenever it was, around the 19, 1886, I think, um, they could have applied for a patent to protect it, uh, but they chose not to. 
recipes are notoriously difficult to reverse engineer. Nobody has done it in over 100 years for the Coca-Cola recipe, nor KFC, nor Hellman's mayonnaise, uh, among many other products on the list. Um, so those are your two choices for protecting an idea, keeping it secret, or patenting it. Now, if you choose to keep it secret, and somebody does figure it out, reverse engineers it, you've lost all of your rights. That's when you wish you'd made a different decision and patented it. So, if your company has a trade secret, like the KFC recipe, and you're to keep it safe, and you tell your mom, is the information in the public domain? I see some nodding heads, both ways. Um, well, it really, and you're both right, because it depends on your mom. Uh, <laughs> so if your mom agrees that she's going to keep it secret, still secret. If your mom is like mine and would blab it around to everybody, then it's in the public domain. And, you know, there's lots of information that companies have that's secret, but you can't use it, you can't benefit from it unless you share it with somebody. So whether you're thinking of doing some sort of a joint venture or it's a marketing plan or whatever, you got to tell somebody. And so um, but as long as you constrain the distribution of it appropriately, then you can keep it secret, unlike with my mom, uh, then you're okay. Can you obtain a patent for a perpetual motion machine? No, because there's no such thing. There are a number of things that um, are excluded from patent rights. One, is, uh, one other example of is, is the patenting of higher life forms. Um, the Harvard, there was the big fight in Canada about patenting the Harvard mouse, which was particularly susceptible to cancer uh, for research purposes. And our uh, Supreme Court of Canada, in a split decision, decided you can't patent that. But you can patent genes, which is a, I don't know, it's beyond my ken. Um, okay. So Steve talked a lot about you know, making money from companies and corporate organization and all of that sort of thing. But, um, you know, unspoken in all of that is you have to have something for the company to do. And, I, you know, from my perspective, um, most companies, what they have is their, certainly for technology companies, a lot of uh, new companies, the, what they're about is really their intellectual property. And, you know, I, I gather you're a room full of entrepreneurs or people who are, are hoping to be entrepreneurs. And somewhere you have an idea germinating away for how you can make money. And what I'm going to talk about is creating, exploiting, and protecting. And I'm going to come back to that when I talk about um, strategy at the end. So what are ideas? They're the things you take home in your head at night. Uh, intangible, they might have tremendous value. Now, not all of your ideas are going to be very valuable. Uh, there's a, a weeding out process you're going to go through. Uh, that's the research and development protest process. You might have a great idea that nobody wants to buy. You might have a great idea, but it's going to kill everybody who uses it. So that's not going to be very good. Um, other keen young entrepreneurs try to uh, profit by copying other people's ideas uh, in one way or another to save that whole research and development market testing process. Um, and that's when you hire me because I stop bad people from doing that. Anticantifitting or whatever the case may be. Um, so the way, an important way that you protect yourself and your business that you want to grow is to protect your intellectual property. So that if somebody wa tries to take your stuff, you have the, the appropriate fences built around it to protect you so you can stop them. Um, there are four main types that I'm going to come to. And I, th those are the ones that I touched on in my example slide. So trademarks, copyrights, patents, and trade secrets. So here's my very sexy graphic. Um, so the ideas are the thing. The, the point here is, you know, you, you start off with a big pool of ideas, a lot of them bad, and you kind of winnow down and winnow down, and then you've got maybe this this creative output. You've got some good ideas, 
And, and then within that, in the center, you've got ideas that can actually also be protected by uh, some form of intellectual property protection. And that's what, you know, if, if you're starting from scratch, you want to aim for. You want to create something that you can build high fences around, high intellectual property fences around to uh, protect it. So what is intellectual property? When I first started practicing intellectual property, I actually studied in law school and I did very, very badly. So uh, it was the lowest mark I had in law school. Uh, so it was a bit of a surprise to me to find myself practicing IP about five years later, not actually remembering anything from law school. I thought, well, I better go back and figure out what this thing is that I'm doing. And I read uh, a bunch of texts that, uh, you know, what is intellectual property? Intellectual property is trademarks, patents, copyrights. And I thought that's really not very satisfying because it's telling me what the subject matter is, but it's not telling me what it is. So I made up my own definition. It's the stuff people can take from you without taking anything from you. So what the hell does that mean? Um, so if you have software code, you own copyright in the code, somebody can copy it and use it and make millions of copies and exploit it from you. You still own your original code, but what they've stolen is the right to, to make copies from you. And you can apply that to the different forms of intellectual property. So it's that, it's that, that's the essence of IP, is the fact that you can copy it and use it. The, the person who created it still has the original thing. Benjamin Franklin uh, uh, has this nice quote about, it, it's a candle, which he called a taper. You start off, you have your candle with a light in it, and someone else can light their candle from yours, and then it can go on and light a million candles. You still have your candle with the light, uh, and you've lit up all of these other things. And that's great if you own the rights, and you're, you know, as a business person, it's great because you're getting profit from all of those lights, but if you didn't take the right steps, the kinds of things I'm going to talk about, then uh, you're giving away your light for free. Maybe that's good. If you're trying to make a profit, not so good. Uh, now, I should say... I encourage you to ask questions as we go along. Um, that way I know what's of interest, of value to you, and I can focus my questions on, on that, or my, my comments on that. So I do encourage you to ask as we go. So what is IP? Uh, so there's the intellectual part of IP. Many people say there's nothing intellectual about it, but it's that kind of mental effort that goes into creating something. So... Copyright often relates to books, screenplays, poems in a traditional sense. Now, often it's uh, software code. Trademarks are often logos, a product or company names, those sorts of things. Business, the, the next one is trade secrets. So you've got business plans, formulas, recipes, business processes. And then the bottom one is um, inventions, which are protected through patents. Yes, sir. Thank you for asking me a question. Um, how can you figure out that something is protectable as, as intellectual property? Like, for example, um, somebody invents a social network like Facebook or whatever, but there's dozens of other social networks out there. They're all slightly different, but they do the same thing. Or there's dozens of you know, photo apps or products that do similar things. Presumably, you can't protect the idea of a social network, for example. Otherwise, there would only be one. So how do you know what's protectable or not? We'll spend a little more time talking about this later. But it's, a, it's an important question because there's no point building a business around something you can't own or building a business around something that someone else already owns. So if, it, if it's, and there are fairly sophisticated ways you can check in particular regarding trademark rights for the name of your company or for patents. Um, patents are harder to check, uh, but there still are uh, very sophisticated mechanisms to check those sorts of things. And certainly one of the things you should be doing as you're going down your development road, is looking to see who else is out there doing what you're doing, and is someone blocking you from what you're doing. So a, a different example than the social networking one, but BlackBerry several years ago, when it was still a major player, 
in the uh, smartphone business. You may recall they were sued by, I've forgotten the name of the company, uh, a patent troll in the US. And they were staring down a potential injunction that would have shut them down in the United States entirely. Um, and that was because BlackBerry didn't do the sort of diligence that you're asking about to see if there's someone else someone else had a patent that they're infringing. Um, and they paid about $650 million to settle that, to buy a license to use the technology. Yet they could have designed, done an engineering design around the patent in about six months. So if they'd backed up several years when they were still in the design phase and done the, said, okay, there's this patent, we, we, we need to figure out a different way to solve the problem, done the design around, they would have save themselves a lot of angst and $650 million. They probably still wouldn't be the number one uh, <laughs> smartphone company in the world, but that's a, that's a branding issue. Um, other questions before I go on? Yes, sir. So if, if you search for patent, like we're doing some, some work and we've been, I've been searching for patents, and it can be just, just a bit discouraging if you type in some of your key things that you're looking at, and there's a, there's a lot of patents out there. How do you know, you know, what is the, how important are some patents that you should stay away from those ideas? It's basically, how do you go forward with there's so many patents out there right now that, have, that are so general, it's very difficult to think of an idea that nobody's ever written anything about. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a couple of different answers okay. to the question, and it's, it's important. Um, you know, one is you have to hire a patent agent. It's too complicated to try to make your way through the, uh, all the patents that are out there to figure, it, figure out the answer to that question. You really have to. Um, it, most patents, though, are improvements on someone else's patent. Uh, and, you know, maybe what the answer is is you find out who's in your way and you get a license from them. Uh, maybe you have an improvement to their patent and you can do a cross-licensing deal. Um, but it's better to know the, the problem so you can solve it than blunder into a problem uh, when it's too late. Uh, so property, the, the property part of intellectual property. So in this context, it usually has some commercial value. That is, it, it gives a bundle of rights to the owner. That's the right to sell the product, license the product, so on and so forth. Uh, so, yes, I love that, thank you. So in software, I would argue that it's probably impossible to create software these days that doesn't violate patents. What about the argument that you're better off not having done the patent search because then you won't be knowingly violating a patent? <laughs> um, I, I don't think that ignorance is a good answer. But frankly. Aren't there significantly higher damages if you're doing it knowingly? Uh, you, there, there's, where, the way you protect yourself from, in the U.S., it's treble damages. The way you protect yourself is to get a non-infringement opinion. That's what protects you, not ignorance. Uh, but to, to, the point you made and the other question both relate to is the breadth of software patents. You know, that there's, that's what has given birth to the problem of uh, non-practicing entities or trolls, right? There's, and that came out of, you know, the explosion of internet-related patents in the uh, late 90s and then afterwards. And, you know, the U.S. Uh, PTO, Patent and Trademark Office, was inundated with patents. Their examiners weren't sufficiently trained, and it's, this isn't an insult to them, it's just this it was the state of the world, and they don't have enough time to do the kind of review and diligence that's really necessary. So you've got these incredibly broad patents that are out there that are arguably, arguably infringing, and that's given birth to, an, uh, well, a, a multi-billion dollar litigation industry in the U.S. Sadly, we don't see much of that up here in Vancouver. <laughs> um, it's, it's not a perfect world. Uh, so um, here's, I've mentioned these four pillars of, copy, uh, of intellectual property law, copyrights, trade secrets, trademarks. Did I say something wrong? <laughs> Love you too. Bye. Um, 
there are other forms of intellectual property, and there's a, a few of them noted there. Um, differences between the four pillars. So I'm going to talk a little bit of substantive uh, IP now, and then we're going to talk about uh, strategy. And then I know Steve is clamoring to get back on the stage. He loves the microphone. Um, so copyrights applies to original works, typically, as it says, literary, dramatic, musical, includes software. Um, original isn't a very high hurdle in this context. Um, it basically means that you didn't copy it from someone else, and it's more than a mechanical reproduction. It's a purely statutory right, and what that means is there is a copyright act. Uh, without the, it's federal, uh, and without the federal copyright act, you could copy uh, anybody's copyrighted stuff without having to worry about it. Rights arise on the creation, not the inception of the idea, but the, you know, the putting pen to paper. Um, so I have, a, I have a, an idea for a killer novel, and I have never written it down. And if I g told you guys about it now, you would be free to go out and write the novel and own the copyright in it, even though I conceived of it. Uh, rights belong to the author. That is the first person to write it down. You don't have to register copyright to have copyrights. Um, although there is a registration process and it does provide some higher value and it's cheap, so you might as well do it. Um, and rights, as a general rule, last for the life of the author plus 50 years. That, that's a sort of a, a, a fairly ancient concept that the idea is, you know, if you're a writer and you create stuff, your family should be able to uh, benefit from it for a, a couple of generations. Uh, one of the dis differences there is um, if you're an employee of a company, then it is just uh, 50 years from uh, creation. Another important thing about copyright for all of you young entrepreneurs to know is that if you hire an independent contractor to create stuff for you, to write code for you, the independent contractor owns the copyright. The company doesn't. It's that, those sorts of things that keep litigators like me employed. Uh, trade secrets. Trade secrets were, uh, I'm only talking about business secrets here, not you know, pillow trysts or that sort of thing. Uh, trade secrets must have business value. You must be able to keep them secret, and they must be subject to efforts to uh, remain secret. They're common law only, and what that means is there isn't a, an, an act or a statute like a Trade Secrets Act. It's, judges have decided over time that they should protect secrets, and so they will come to your aid as, if someone else is stealing your secrets. Uh, and rights last only for so long as you keep them secret. Trademarks apply to names, designs, you know, logos, that sort of thing. Um, you can have rights in a trademark from use without ever registering a trademark. You can have quite strong rights. It's much easier if, you, if, you, if someone is, is using your name or logo, it's much easier to enforce your rights if you have a registration. So it's a good idea to uh, obtain trademark protection, trademark registration. And you can have rights forever. What that means is you, you have, a, in Canada, you have 15 years. Uh, registration lasts for 15 years. If you re-register it, you can keep doing that in perpetuity. Last but not least of my four pillars is patents. Applies to inventions that are new, useful, and non-obvious. New in this case is a very high test. Uh, it is the first in the world. Um, not the first in Canada. All the patent rights are regional, so if you get a patent, it's, your rights apply. If you get a patent in Canada, your rights apply only for Canada. But to get the patent, it has to be a, 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 an invention that's the first in the world. It uh, has to be non-obvious. That's uh, otherwise phrased as the G, why didn't I think of that test? Uh, and it has to have some kind of uh, useful purpose. Again, it's a statutory right, so there's a patent act. Uh, without it, we wouldn't have patent rights. Rights arise on registration. 
there's a several year process typically between the application and the registration and you're in a bit of a limbo during that period. An important thing to keep in mind is uh, with one caveat, you lose your patent rights if you publish it. So there's no shortage of academics who have, as you know, pressure to publish about their research who have lost the right to patent things because of the pressure to publish. Canada, the United States, and Mexico give you a one-year window. I believe every other country in the world, it's, it's the instant it's published, you lose your right to patent. Rights belong to the inventor, but uh, most places that employ people to invent uh, have as part of the employment contract that all of the inventions are actually automatically transferred to and owned by the employer. And rights last for 20 years from the date of application. Yeah. Um, if I understand you right, then if I obtain a patent in Canada, nobody else in the world can then apply for a patent for that idea. No, that's not. I'm not necessarily protected. Any that's wrong? No, that's wrong. Okay. So uh, you have to be the first in the world to invent it, but patent rights are regional. So if you have a Canadian patent, you have protection only in Canada. But there's a partial solution to that. Uh, there is a treaty that allows you to apply in one country and then designate a whole bunch of other countries. There's, I forget, 180 that are on, under this, the PCT or Patent Cooperation Treaty. And you can say, you know, you're going to apply in all of them or some subset, subset of them. And then you've got, I believe it's an 18-month window to decide if you're actually going to apply in those other jurisdictions. So that gives you an opportunity to continue you know, your research and development, your marketing, and so on. And if you desire, decide to proceed in you know, Norway and Nigeria, um, you can then enter what's called the national phase of the patent application process. What that allows you to do is it's as though you have planted your, you know, your flag in all of those other countries at the first date but put off spending the money in the other countries for that period of time. So just to clarify then, if I do not exercise that right, somebody in another country can apply for a patent for the same idea? They can't apply for the patent because they're right. not the first that's in the what world I to was, Right, that's what I was trying to understand. But they can make it. Right, yeah, I'm not protected in those countries, but right. they can't apply for a right. patent. So I could go in at a later date, right. apply for the patent. Exactly right. Um, <clears throat> sorry, one follow-up. Er, Separate yeah. question. Yeah. Well, what's the protection at different stages when you go from provisional to pending to, you know, well, granted, I guess we understand, but in the first two, what, what's my protection at those early stages? Um, fear of getting sued later. Okay. Because <laughs> you know, the rights arise once it's actually registered. Okay. Okay. Not as soon as you apply for it. Right. So different than, for example, copyright where the rights arise as soon as you create the work. Your rights are, but you know, you're, you're giving notice to people, that's why you say patent pending. Sure. But you don't have any rights to enforce until your, your patent is registered. Okay. So, talking about strategy now. Um, I think it's important to have an IP strategy. And there is no like Steve was saying around, um, you know, precedents for, uh, you know, I don't know, shareholders agreements or whatever the case may be, there is no one-size-fits-all IP strategy. It has to fit into your business plan, your financial resources, where you are in the industry. Are you, are you a big company? Are you a small company? Are you new? Are you well-established? You know, a whole lot of factors. Um, there are, to my mind, three key components. Identifying, well, I'll spend a little more time on each of these, but identifying uh, what you can and can't own, protecting what you can, and, and then exploiting or profiting from what you have. So, and we talked a bit about and this already in response to one of the questions, ensure you can own what you're developing. Because uh, it, it, there's no point putting a ton of money, whether it's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, or in, you know, 
in Rim's case, millions of dollars into developing a product and finding out down the road you actually are infringing someone else's stuff. That's a bad thing. Um, so search before you invest. As I said, there's lots of sophisticated research resources around trademarks, patents, and to some degree copyrights. Uh, make sure you own it. Uh, again, you know, if uh, I think I've really touched on this. Uh, if you have employees inventing for you, uh, make sure that they're transferring their rights. Uh, if you need, if you have an invention and you find out, and this is again touching on a question that someone asked, uh, if there's someone else in your way, um, you know, if it's a patent and it's fundamental to what you need to do and you can't design around it, well, approach them and maybe you can do a cross licensing deal. People do cross licensing deals all the time. It's a lot easier with something like um, a trademark. You know, if you find out you're infringing someone's name, well, it's a lot easier to just change your name. It can be embarrassing if you have to do it down the road. And I've I've helped a number of people out of those sort of embarrassing points. Um, uh, copyright is, in a sense, easier. And let me uh, explain something about what I I mean around that. So if if you have if you have a competitor's product, uh, some sort of a, a, you know, software-based product, and you like the way it works, you can go off and uh, you know, figure out what all the, what are all the us- what's all the user functionality you want to create, then ask a programmer to create it, and then you know, basically you're copying the functionality, but, that's not, but you're not comp- copying how that functionality is achieved. So as a general rule, and I'm not suggesting you go off and do that based on just my you know, sort of brief comments here, as a general rule, you can copy someone else's product in that way. Okay? Because you're not copying the underlying code that makes it work. Uh, an important distinction that is in copyright law that I didn't touch on, though, is that you know, copyright protects the expression of ideas. It doesn't protect the ideas. User functionality is the ideal level. Code to achieve that user functionality is, is the expression level. So um, there may be a ways out of those sorts of jams when you find someone else's stuff you need to copy. We need a microphone up front here, please. Quick, quick, quick. Um, so I guess my question was, when we're talking about developers, if I'm the one that's come up with the idea, I'm not a developer, but I've strictly given them the guidelines on how to develop yes. a product, are you then telling me that because they developed it that they own the copyright and not me? Are they because they did the development, are I they, did not. Are they your employees? Yes, they will be employees. Then the company owns the copyright. Okay. But then you actually would have an agreement set up with the employees ahead of time when you hire them. Well, if they're an employee, yeah. under the Copyright Act, their employer automatically owns anything they create that's subject to copyright. Okay. okay. Not patents. You need to assign the patents as part of the employment agreement. If it's an independent contractor that you hire who's not an employee, they need to expressly assign the copyright and the code to you. Okay. So it's, it's an important distinction. I need between, to do both. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> That's okay. I'm in trouble. <laughs> S- Steve can help you with those sorts of things. Um, and the point of one year, does that mean if you're developing software and or your competitors develop software and they didn't apply for a patent until after a year that they've released that software, is that patent still valid? Um, it, it is... If it's publicly disclosed, so it depends on whether the release of the software publicly discloses whatever's patented. So it, it you know, it might be that it, you know, you get the object code, but the real secret sauce is in the source code, and you can't see it. That's where the patent sort of is. So it's an it depends answer. Okay. Um, so the, maybe the, the most important point about this identification is develop stuff that you can protect. 
uh, and then protect it. We've talked a fair bit about this. There are you know, different types of protection. I, I don't want to uh, spend too much time on this. And I think my next slide is my last slide. Oh, sorry, I do want to talk about something. When you're thinking about what you can protect, and this is where how uh, you know, the size of your company, how well you established you are, is going to make it, uh, have a significant impact. You know, it's how much money do you have to spend? Um, and where do you want to do business? You can blow your brains out applying for protection around the world. And, you know, most companies are quite selective about that. Um, you know, they might, in, in the patent cooperation treaty I was talking about, designate quite a number of countries, but at the end, narrow it down to a few select countries. Um, I've heard that some people employ a strategy that, you know, where they will apply for patent protection only in their biggest markets and in the markets where they're most likely to get knocked off. So they're protecting the revenue in the big markets so they can stop people there. And then they're using their IP protection in the countries where they're likely to get knocked off to stop the counterfeiters. So things to think about. And then exploitation. <clears throat> Once you uh, have your IP identified and protected, you get revenue from you know, making or selling products, licensing it. Uh, you can sell the IP outright, whatever the case may be. And whatever those are, you know, uh, you have to have clean IP. The cleaner your IP, the more value is your company. If, uh, um, you know, if somebody's going to come in and wants to buy your company, one of the things they're going to spend a fair bit of time on in the due diligence process is looking at what your IP rights are. Um, and if you don't have, you know, your employment agreements in place, uh, transferring patents, if you have hired independent contractors to write code without you know, transferring rights in the uh, copyright, those sorts of things, then your value goes down and maybe down dramatically. So, a few questions. Um, this may be how long is a piece of rope, but how much does it cost to patent something? Uh, well, you know, it's an it depends thing, but I think you can budget fifteen to $20,000 for a patent. You know, complex life sciences stuff up from there. Okay. Steve, is that in the ballpark in your experience? Asking the wrong guy, friend. All right. I thought you knew everything. A question about the um, talking about a little bit about publishing. The moment something's published, you use your rights. A lot of us startups are encouraged to use um, some of the educational institutes for students, and you get engaged grants and things like that. So, and all they say is that we want to publish what we're working with you on. So, can you speak a little bit about publishing this, and that we could lose our rights by working with some of these students and educational institutes? It's it, this only applies to patents. Um, and if you are, you know, I, th I think the academics are the worst for this. Um, if you are, you know, I don't know, life sciences guy, and you are working on a new molecule or something, and you write a paper about it, because that's important for getting tenure, and as soon as that is published, if you haven't applied for a provisional patent or something, taken the right steps, you have lost your rights everywhere in Canada except, everywhere in the world rather, except Canada, the United States, and Mexico, where you have a one-year window. It's, it's a pretty binary thing. There are times when you, you know, if you can, if, if you need to publish to a small-ish circle, and you can do, certainly do it under a, a terms of a non-disclosure agreement and protect your rights there. It doesn't mean you can't disclose it to anyone. You just can't disclose it publicly. Another question? Uh, hello, I have questions about licensing. Uh, suppose you are a big company and I license my patent to you uh, for a section of the industry, and then I, I go bankruptcy. I have no money to run the business. I go bankruptcy. So if you third party infringe the patent, can you, you as a big company, can you to Enforce it, uh, show it, show the company who infringed uh, the 
patent? I, I actually don't know what happens to patent rights on bankruptcy. Uh, I know they're addressed under the Bankruptcy and Insolvency Act, but I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't know the answer to your question. I, I mean, sir, uh, you, you are a big company. I license my patent to you. Yeah. Uh, and then I have no money to enforce the, the infringement. Yeah, suppose if you're, if you're, suppose if, somebody, he make uh, the same thing uh, as the patent, they infringe the right. Uh, who can sue the third party? So if, if you're the patent holder and I'm the licensee, right? Yeah, yeah. And you go bankrupt. Yeah. You're, well, it's, as I understand it, then the trustee owns your, your patent, not you. The trustee in bankruptcy would be responsible for your patent. It doesn't matter if anybody's infringing it or anything. It's, it's the trustee's decision then what to do. If somebody's enforcing it, the trustee can decide, well, I will enforce you know, it or not. Chances are a trustee would never do that. Trustee would just look for somebody to sell it to at a reasonable price. I think infringement becomes a pretty secondary, interest, uh, secondary issue in the context of a bankruptcy. I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I think that's the reality. You know, a, a lot of it will depend on what the terms of the license that you gave to the big company says, because a lot of them will have provisions in it that will say in the event that you go under the patent uh, is either you know irrevocably assigned over or they have the ability to take over that patent and so on. So the big companies are not going to be left uh, sitting there wondering what can they do. They've gone off and in relying on your license have expended a lot of money and are out there trying to conquer the world on their own. So they're going to make sure that they have the ability to deal with that. And that will be purely contractual. Um, if you uh, don't have something like that and you go bankrupt, then that IP, that patent, is just one of the assets of the bankrupt estate, just like a chair is or anything else would be. And so uh, whoever ends up buying the assets at a bankruptcy, I believe, are entitled to buy that patent, are entitled to deal with it. If nobody gives a damn and your patent just sits there mothballed somewhere, and you saw a lot of that happening you know, right after the tech boom a number of years ago, uh, where there were VCs and others who, under security agreements, took over uh, assets of companies they invested in. There's many, many, many patents sitting on a shelf somewhere that are owned by VCs and others that they've just forgotten all about. And if nobody's going to enforce it, nobody enforces it. And people are just out there uh, uh, breaching these patents all over the place. And it's just the reality that nobody cares. Hi. You touched upon non-disclosures earlier um, in the previous question. Um, just out of curiosity, how important is it to have a non-disclosure document statement in the idea phase, and um, it, does that protect your conversations with people? You know, it, it's an the intellectual it, idea, I guess. Yeah, it's an it depends answer. So if you know, if it's you and a partner working in your garage, and you're not telling anybody else about it, you don't need one. You know, you don't have to have a non-disclosure agreement for things to be confidential. Um, you know, if you have, uh, I'm not suggesting necessarily that you do this, but some people will make a pitch and it will say, you know, this document is confidential. By receiving it, you agree that it's confidential and you put it down, you know, on the bottom of every page and so on. You can oblige someone to keep it confidential in that way. But, but really, you know, it's really the circumstances that dictate what you should do in any, to protect your confidential information. So if you are marketing your idea because you want to raise money, you want to ask people to sign a non-disclosure agreement as part of that process. And then some will just say, no, we get too many ideas. We have to trust us. We're not going to steal your idea. If we think it's good, we'll do business with you. And you just have to make a business decision about whether or not you trust them. So investors aside, what about developers as you're soliciting developers to get them to be part of the, the uh, project? And so you haven't hired them yet, but you're trying to uh, engage them? Yeah, I think that would be a good time to use an NDA. Thank you. OK. I think we're out of time. Any more questions? One more question. Uh, 
Hi. What if I develop an application and let's say I invent something like Twitter pull to refresh feature, and then I publish this uh, application with this feature, and can I apply for a patent after I release this application for that feature? You know, you know, I, I, there's not enough flesh on the question to to answer it except in a general way. Um, if it's if it's out there, if you've if you've published the you know this this particular feature and the world can understand how it works, that's a publication that voids your patent rights, as I said, in everywhere except Canada, the United States, and, and Mexico. Um, so you should be very wary about doing that. But okay. it, you know, it, it, some, some things, you, when you publish them, you can't figure out what the secret sauce is in it. And that's okay. That's not a, a publication that voids your rights. One last, how about one last Thank question you. back there and then. Who was it? So just a quick question further to the publishing issue. So what if somebody um, presents uh, a concept at an international event? Is that technically publishing? Nothing's been distributed. It's been presented in front you know, of a group. It, again, it's, it's really, the answer is really the same. It depends on what you're publishing, uh, if it's just the concept. In this particular case, um, actually, the, I think the wording and the questions become the expression of the IP. So uh, although it's not software code, it in this industry would be relevant. Right. But obviously, that would have to be, I guess, considered by yourself. Yeah. You know, in a, a, a patent, the patent application, the published patent, has to have enough information to allow a person skilled in the art to make the thing, whatever the thing is, right? If you are saying, I have a concept for you know, building a better mousetrap, and you don't say, and, and here's how you build it, that's okay. That's not a publication of the details of how you build the invention, whatever the invention is. So you can certainly talk about it without avoiding your patent rights, but you kind of have to get into the details to, to figure out whether or not you've done it. Thank you very much. Appreciate all your questions.